Good morning and welcome. Welcome to this New Year's Day service. We extend a warm welcome to guests and visitors who are with us and those who are joining us uh, also through the internet. We pray that God may richly bless us this day and every day in this year. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 89, which mentions twice in two verses the faithfulness of God. At the beginning of this year, we want to remember how faithful God has been. Psalm 89, verses one and two, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. Let us pray. And gracious Heavenly Father, great is your faithfulness. Indeed, your, your faithfulness uh, is established in the very heavens. It has been established uh, by your covenant that you have made with your people to be our God and to make us your people. And so we gather this day in remembrance of the mercies of this past year and with faith in your promises for the year to come, we gather this day to sing of your faithfulness to us and to make known your faithfulness to all generations. Receive our worship, we pray, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us join together and praise God for his faithfulness by singing selection number 245, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Stand if you're able and sing all three stanzas of number 245.
Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. To lead us in the worship of God this morning, I want to read to you Psalm 30, found on page 635 in the Pew Bible. Before reading it, let me just uh, give a brief explanation of this psalm. Psalm 30 is a psalm of praise that, in which David praises God for deliverance from a time of personal crisis. That crisis came about not because of enemies or sickness, but because of his own internal weakness. It came about because in his success, he became proud of his accomplishments. Uh, Dr. Robert Godfrey in his book on uh, the Psalms says that at some high point in his reign, David came to think of his own state as secure and unchanging and as a result of his own work. Uh, that comes to expression when he says, David says in this uh, psalm in verse 6, uh, Now in my prosperity I shall never be moved. Well, there are many places in the psalms and in uh, other parts of Scripture where David attributes his success to the Lord. But it appears there came this time in his prosperity when he forgot that. And because he forgot it, the Lord hid his face from David and raised up enemies against him and caused him to be sick almost to death uh, so that he thought he was almost in the grave. But then the Lord relented. Uh, weeping tarried for the night, but joy comes in the morning. David uh, humbled his heart and the Lord relented. The Lord heard his prayers and the Lord restored him. And now David is again praising God for God's goodness in bringing him back to his senses. And uh, this is a good psalm for us this day because uh, God deals with us in the same way. Sometimes we become proud and we forget him and then he uh, causes trouble and we cry out to him and uh, he hears us and answers us and helps us because indeed he is a gracious God. Psalm 30, a, song, a psalm, a song of, at the dedication of the house of David. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me, lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at his remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood? When I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I give thanks to you forever. Let's sing that same psalm as we find it in Selection 30. And uh, we'll remain seated and sing all five stanzas of number 30, O Lord, I will extol you.
us unite our hearts together and come before God in prayer. O Lord, our God, Heavenly Father, glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we do extol you and praise you that you have lifted us up and that you have given us victory over our enemy, over our enemy, Satan, and over sin and death and hell. We thank you and rejoice before you for indeed, when we were brought low, we cried to you, and you heard our prayer. You lifted us up, and now we give you praise. Father, we confess that all that we have, we have from you, and you have indeed given us much. May we never say that we have these things on our own, but uh, help us, O oh Father, to uh, boast only in the Lord and in what you have given us. Father, as we reflect on this past year, we see your hand of mercy as you have led us uh, from day to day. You have uh, kept us alive. You have uh, given us riches uh, beyond uh, all that we uh, deserve. We thank you, Father, for health and strength. We thank you for family and friends. We thank you for our community. We thank you especially for our church uh, we thank you for the opportunities that you give us to come and worship and serve you. We thank you for your servant, uh, Reverend Lubbers, and for his faithful proclamation of your word by which uh, the lost are gathered in and the faithful are built up. We pray, Father, that you would continue to bless this congregation and uh, all who serve here, be especially with the elders and the deacons and the pastor as they labor among us, May your hand of mercy uh, and uh, grant them uh, wisdom and uh, strength to honor you in all that they say and do. And may we together be built up as the body of Christ and become mature so that uh, we may be a bright and shining light uh, both here in our community and uh, through our missionary outreach uh, to uh, far distant places in the world. We pray, O oh Father, for the Church of Jesus Christ in the world. We pray that as we begin a new year, we may begin anew the work that you have given us to do, to uh, go into all the world and to make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that you have commanded. We pray, Father, that we may be faithful in that task and that we may be energized uh, each day to uh, be uh, a bright and shining light for Jesus wherever you have placed us. Father, we pray for those of our number who are hurting. We uh, pray for those who have suffered uh, bereavement and uh, especially those who are going through uh, the holiday season and missing uh, greatly those who used to be among us but are now with you. We pray, Father, that you would be close to uh, uh, widows and uh, widowers and those who have, others who have lost loved ones, we pray that you would comfort their hearts and may they find comfort in the family of God here on earth and encouragement to persevere in faith day by day. Be with those who are sick and ill. We pray especially for Donna Jindro that you would uh, ease her pain and uh, that you would uh, grant wisdom to her doctors as to how uh, they can best help her. O oh, Father, be with others who are recovering from uh, surgery or from uh, uh, who are undergoing treatment. May that uh, treatment and surgery be effective in restoring uh, strength and health and the ability to be up and about and doing the things that you have given us to do, especially that we may evermore uh, live for you, to give you thanks and praise for all that you have done for us through our Savior Jesus Christ, in that he loved us and gave his life for us, living a righteous life and uh, offering atonement for our sins so that uh, in him we have all the righteousness that we need, perfect righteousness, to uh, stand before you this day. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us in the year that is ahead. Keep us from the power of the evil one. Make us strong in faith and in prayer and enable us to grow together in love and service uh, to you and to one another. We ask this all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let us continue to worship God in song by singing selection number uh, 115B. We'll uh, sing four stanzas, omitting the last standing, if you're able, to, stanzas one through four of 115B.
Our scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 12, page 1199 in the Pew Bible, page 1199, Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 13 and reading through verse 34. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So he who lays up treasure for himself, and is so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide for yourselves money bags, which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As far the reading of God's word, may he add his blessing to it. Beloved of the Lord, annual checkups are a wise practice. Annual checkups, whether it's regard to your finances or to your health or to your spiritual life. And what I would like to do today is to uh, do a little spiritual checkup on your spiritual life, particularly with regard to three great virtues that the Apostle Paul identifies in his letter to the Corinthians in that uh, well-known love chapter, chapter 13, where he says, uh, these three abide, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. How are you doing in the area of faith, hope, and love. Let us consider looking back over the past year, for example, and say, now, how has my faith been? How has my hope been? How has my love been? Am I the way I should be? And if not, what can I do in order to improve that for the year to come? Now, in order to do that check up, Uh, I want to use uh, the theme of the text which is before us today, uh, which is money. (laughs) 
Now, that may not sound very spiritual, but if you make that uh, judgment, you're making a mistake. The subject of money indeed is very spiritual. Uh, the Bible has a great deal to say about it. Uh, the Eighth Commandment, uh, you shall not steal, is about money. Uh, the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet, is about money. That's 20% uh, of the Ten Commandments deal with money and property and wealth and things of that nature. Uh, the number of Jesus' parables is somewhat disputed among scholars, but uh, uh, a good guess is there are about 39 parables, and at least nine of them, like the one that is before us today, deal with money. And that's, again, about 25% of Jesus' parables deal with money. He dealt with money in his uh, Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew chapter 6, some of which is echoed here in this passage in Luke 12. He dealt with uh, uh, money in the uh, parable of the talents, in the parable of the unmerciful servant, uh, in the parable of the four, four soils, where he talks about how the deceitfulness of riches prevented uh, the seed of the word from taking root and so forth. And uh, he talked about uh, the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and we could go on. Also in his real encounters, not just his uh, parables, but he, he dealt with uh, rich people like the rich young ruler who went away sorrowful because his possessions were great, or an opposite uh, kind of rich man, uh, Zacchaeus, who pledged to give half of his wealth to the poor. Uh, rich and riches are mentioned at least 15 times just in Luke's gospel. Perhaps because money was such a frequent topic of Jesus, someone in the crowd came to Jesus and asked a money question. He had a money problem, and he thinks uh, uh, Jesus has a lot to say about money, so maybe he can help me with my money problems. And uh, he uh, comes uh, to ask for help with his inheritance. Now, the Bible is clear, of course, that money of itself is not uh, evil. Uh, Abraham and Job were quite wealthy and did not succumb to the love of money or the deceitfulness of riches. Uh, Joseph and uh, Daniel rose to positions of great power and uh, experienced the uh, trappings of power, which include uh, great uh, wealth and comfort, but they did not uh, give in to uh, the greed and avarice that uh, others ha might have in those positions. But sadly, they are somewhat of an exception to the rule. The general rule is that uh, with uh, riches come temptation, and uh, by that temptation, many have made shipwreck of their faith. Nehemiah, in his uh, great prayer in Nehemiah 9, I think it is, uh, says uh, that Israel grew fat on the kindness of God. They grew wealthy, they grew rich, and they grew fat, and they forsook God. And Nehemiah says they threw God's law behind their backs. Well, because money is a spiritual subject, it is a good uh, reality check. Uh, the late Reverend Tim Keller uh, says we can use money to uh, uh, check how well we are doing in the areas of faith, hope, and love. How does that work? Well, just uh, simply uh, faith. Uh, what, what is it that, uh, where is your security? Is it in the fact that uh, God is taking care of you, or uh, does the only thing that make you feel safe knowing that your uh, 401k or your IRA or your uh, land holdings are sufficient so that you have enough to, to meet all your needs? Are you, uh, is your security in your money or is it in God? Uh, what are you hoping for? Are you hoping to get rich or are you hoping to get closer to God? And what about love? Do you love God? You say you love God, but how do you measure that? Well, John in his epistle says that our love for God is measured by our love for our fellow man. If you see your brother in need and you don't help him, 
then you don't love him. And if you don't love him, you don't love God. And our fellow man has two great needs. Uh, All mankind need the gospel, and many of mankind need food, clothing, and shelter. They need material assistance. And so your generosity to the cause of missions and benevolence is a good measure, a good test of your love for God. And so with that in mind, I want to look at uh, what our text has to say. But before we get into uh, looking at the warning that Jesus uh, gives here in verse uh, 15, Uh, One more word of introduction, and and that's this. Uh, Whenever a a minister talks about money, there are always some, perhaps those who are not fully committed or not fully committed yet uh, to the Lord, who say, ah, preachers, they just want our money. Well, if you are not fully committed, to the Lord Jesus Christ, let me tell you that the Lord does not want your money. But he does want you to hear what he says to his followers about money. I know that for a fact because in uh, Luke chapter 12, if I had started at the beginning, if you still have your Bibles open and look at verse 1, it says there, in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people gathered together so that they trampled one another, Jesus began to say to his disciples, uh, there's an innumerable crowd, there's thousands of people, and uh, in front of them, Jesus speaks to his disciples. And at one point, Peter gets confused in verse 41 of that same chapter. He says, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all the people? Now, Peter would not be confused about whether Jesus is speaking to the crowd or to the people if the crowd could not hear. The crowd can hear. Jesus is speaking in such a way that the crowd can hear. He wants the crowd to hear what he is saying to his disciples. And so today's message is directed to you who are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you are not, the Lord wants you to hear this as well, to see what he says to them. With that in mind, let us consider here first the warning that Jesus gives, a warning to be on guard against covetousness against greed, against uh, money sickness. The warning comes in response to this request to Jesus to be an arbiter in a family dispute. The inheritance was not divided equally. One had the most and wouldn't share. The other had the least and wanted more. Sadly, throughout my ministry, I have seen this on several occasions. I have actually had parishioners come to me and ask me to help settle a dispute over a will. And uh, I have seen people come to the consistory and ask for help in settling a dispute over the will. Jesus refuses to arbitrate on this occasion. Why Why does he do that? Isn't he the judge of all the earth? Yes, God has appointed him to be the judge, and one day we will all stand before him as our judge. He will judge each one of us, and everything that we have done wrong will be brought to light. If you have caused problems in your family by treating your children unjustly in a matter of inheritance, Uh, that will be brought to light when you stand before Jesus, and you may be greatly ashamed on that day, hopefully no more than just ashamed. And if you have benefited materially by an unjust uh, distribution of the family fortune and have not done all you can to be reconciled to your brothers and sisters, if you have not uh, shown to them that family is more important than money and that uh, you love them more than you love wealth, then on that day you will be ashamed and uh, hopefully not more than ashamed. And if you have suffered injustice in a matter of inheritance, 
and have not learned to forgive as you have been forgiven and have not put to death your lust for money, then you too will be ashamed on that day and hopefully no more than ashamed. Jesus will be the judge of all such matters, but not when he was on earth for his first earthly ministry. He had not come to judge, but to save. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day when Jesus calls sinners to repentance. Now is the day when Jesus comes to make atonement for sin. That is, in his life on the earth, he had come not to judge, but to make atonement for our sins, to pay for our sins, so that we are no more than ashamed of our sins on the judgment day, ashamed of those sins which thankfully are fully covered by the blood of Christ, if indeed we have repented of them and trusted in his shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins. That was his earthly ministry. His earthly ministry was not to judge, but to suffer and die in our place. Now we need to look at this warning that he gives in response to the request. He says, uh, be on guard, take heed, and beware of covetousness. That take heed or be on guard means that this is something you have to watch out for. It's something you have to be careful about. It's something that uh, if you are not careful, you might miss. That's not the case with every sin. If you've committed murder, you know it. If you have committed adultery, you know it. But if you have fallen prey to covetous desire, if you have fallen prey to greed and avarice, it might be that you are not aware. There are circumstances where dangers are hidden from us and uh, we don't see them clearly, and this is one of them. If a soldier is posted on guard duty, at night, and he is suspicious that there might be some trouble lurking out in the darkness, he shouts out a question. Who goes there? He questions. Well, that's what we have to do to be on guard. We have to ask questions. Have I fallen prey to covetous desire, to greed and avarice with regard to faith, hope, and love. We need to uh, ask that because it is not obvious. Jesus warned about the deceitfulness of riches that prevents the word from taking root and bearing fruit. He does that after saying that many heard the word of God gladly. They heard the word gladly but it didn't bear fruit, it didn't take root because of the deceitfulness of riches, of riches. The reason it's so deceptive in part is because we are daily bombarded with the, the details of the lives of people who are above us on the economic ladder. We see rich people on television, we see them on the internet, we see them in the tabloid magazines, we, see them uh, uh, in the grocery store, we may see them in the next pew in church. Even if you have a six-figure salary, it's not hard to find somebody in your circle of acquaintances who is earning more than you. And we see their lives of conspicuous consumption, and uh, we drive past their big homes and uh, see their fancy clothes and so forth, and it's very easy to say, I'm deprived. <laughs> I don't have enough and uh, I need more. It's very rare that people think they spend too much on themselves. Perhaps if you've just come back from a mission to a third world country and have seen people in tin sh shacks or mud huts, Perhaps you might come home and look at your home and feel a bit guilty, but that doesn't last long. 
before we uh, start again looking at our friends and relations and all their latest gadgets and gizmos and new pickups and bigger houses and fancier clothing and all the trappings of wealth uh, that uh, we see around them. And so we need to be on guard and we need to ask the question, uh, who goes there? <laughs> Am I, uh, is, is greed and avarice out there lurking, trying uh, to, to get me? This uh, money sickness of greed and materialism is, uh, is not hard to find, uh, hard to define. Uh, it uh, simply means uh, we make too much of money and things. Uh, we make them more important than anything else. But knowing when we've uh, crossed the line, that's, that's the hard thing to determine. We always draw the line a little bit further away from us than we should. So Jesus gives us some help in knowing whether we have crossed the line. He gives us some uh, signs or symptoms of this money sim uh, sickness. He gives us five signs in particular. He says, first of all, uh, if you are trusting in money, then you are guilty of making too much of it. We see that in the words of the man in the parable who says, I have plenty. I can take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. He is trusting in his wealth. His barns are full. He says, I have plenty for many years and now I can relax, now I can feel safe and secure. He feels safe and secure in what he possesses. But thinking that money is security is foolishness. Uh, Jesus says here, you fool, this night your soul will be quite required of you. It can all disappear in a flash. My great-grandfather, one of my great-grandfathers, built up a, uh, an iron foundry where he made uh, boilers and uh, steam generators. He had a big business. He had a successful business. But uh, in his later years, in the 1920s, he sold his business and uh, sold it for over a million dollars, a huge sum of money. And he invested his money in three different banks, and he sat on the board of three different banks in the late 1920s. You know where this story is going, don't you? If you know what happened in October, Black Friday, 1929, all the banks failed, and my great-grandfather lost almost all his money. It was just gone, just like that, in a, a great stock market crash of, uh, of Black Friday, 1929. That sort of thing happens in all sorts of different ways. Forces outside your control, you're a hard worker, you save, you seem to invest wisely, but somehow forces beyond your control, it just it can all evaporate. And if it doesn't happen in life, it certainly will happen in death because you will not be able to take it with you. Trusting in money is foolishness. Money can't save you. It can't cure your illnesses. It can't save you from death. Some of you may remember billionaire Steve Jobs co-founder of Apple Computer. He was an extremely wealthy and powerful man. He died of cancer at the age of 56. His money couldn't buy a cure. His money couldn't prolong his life. He died and didn't take his money with him. His money did him no good when he stood before the judgment seat of God. It's foolish to trust in money. A second sign of money sickness is uh, beside trusting in money and finding your security in it, is hoarding your money, keeping it all. 
Again, in this parable, it says that uh, he built his barns. I will pull down the barns, and uh, I will store all my crops and my goods. I'm going to store it all. I'm not going to share it with anyone. When presented with a worthy need or a charitable cause, such a person says, no, I need it more than they do. If he gives anything, it is a pittance, but nothing of substance. One of the practical tests by which you can test for money sickness is looking at your charitable donations, or perhaps your lack of charitable donations. Jesus says in this passage, sell what you have, verse 33, sell what you have and give alms. Sell what you have and give alms. Give to the poor. Calvin, in commenting on Luke 12, verse uh, 33, says, uh, Jesus does not say, sell all your possessions, but he does say that our giving must be to the extent of even selling income-producing property, and he cross-references Barnabas of the book of Acts, Barnabas whose name was not originally Barnabas, uh, that was a new name given to him which means son of encouragement, Barnabas who sold a field and laid it at the apostles' feet. We might think, you know, a field is a source of income and one could uh, take the income from that field from uh, year to year and lay that at the apostles' feet and perhaps over the course of many years uh, bring far more money than simply selling the field and uh, ending it as a source of income. But the people of that day saw needs, real, genuine need of poor people, and they saw that if they sold the field, they could meet that need. The book of Acts says other people sold houses, uh, presumably not their own house, but they owned more than one, and uh, could sell the house. Again, income-producing property, but it met an immediate need for the people, and they trusted God with regard to the future. They said, well, yes, so we're selling income-producing property, but that's all right because we have a God who controls all things, and he will provide what we need. And so uh, they sold income-producing property. In Luke chapter 11, uh, the previous chapter from our text, Jesus condemns the Pharisees because although they tithe the mint and dill and other herbs and spices, they neglected justice and the love of God. Uh, he says you should have done the latter without neglecting the former, meaning, yes, you should tithe. It's uh, the one place in the New Testament where Jesus endorses the tithe for New Testament believers. But he says, more than the tithe, you should also show love for God. And we think about the Old Testament where people not only tithed, but they left the corners of the field and the second uh, ripening of uh, fruit and uh, produce and so forth. They left that for the poor so that uh, they gave much more than the tithe to those who were in need. Uh, generosity is a test of whether you are uh, guilty are, are suffering from money sickness. In addition to trusting in wealth and hoarding wealth, a third uh, symptom of money sickness is, uh, is worry. People worry about where they're going to find the money for all the things that they think they might need, food, clothing, shelter, medicine, money, money to impress others, money for vacations. They worry about whether uh, their uh, work is uh, going to last? Will I be able to keep my job? Am I going to get fired? Am I going to get laid off? Is the business going to prosper? They worry that uh, they might uh, lose the ability to provide for uh, the family, for the children. You know, the family's growing. We need a newer car. We need a bigger house. We, how are we ever going to afford it all? They make the error of thinking that uh, money is security, only they, they don't have any. You know, it's the same sin as the wealthy, but uh, 
it's uh, in reverse uh, because they, they are trusting in wealth, but uh, because they don't have any, instead of boasting about their wealth, they uh, worry about where they're going to get what they need. Uh, like uh, the rich man, the worrier hangs on to whatever money he has. He says, I need it more than they do. Jesus says, uh, do not worry about your life, what you eat, or about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, and uh, they don't have barns, and God feeds them, and you are much more valuable than any bird. God will take care of you. You don't need to worry. A fourth sign of money sickness is uh, that people use money to try to impress other people. Look at me. I have arrived. I have made it. I have made something of myself. And they say that by the mansion they build by the luxury car that they drive, by the jewelry that they wear. They seek to make an impression upon others by saying, hey, look at me, look how well I have done. These are people who don't hoard their money. They spend it like crazy and often spend more than they have so that they have huge credit card debt or huge home equity loans. But they're not spending it on other people, they're spending it on their selves. Uh, they they, they uh, are uh, ignorant of the fact that uh, money really doesn't uh, create respect, it creates envy. And if you have friends, you can never be sure if they like you because they're using you to help boost themselves on the social ladder, using you to access uh, uh, an economic strata higher than the one that they are already in. Uh, and the friendship might disappear the moment you might lose uh, any of the outward trappings of wealth. Jesus says, consider the lilies how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. God can make you far more beautiful than any jewelry or clothing or car or house that you might purchase for yourself. He creates beauty within by a gentle and quiet spirit, by a godly character. That is the kind of beauty that you should strive for. In addition to trusting in wealth or hoarding wealth and worrying about wealth or using wealth to impress people, a last, a fifth sign of money sickness is running after it. Jesus says, for all these things the nations of the world seek after. Uh, in other places or other translations, it says the pagans run after these things. This is the workaholic who sacrifices family life, who sacrifices involvement in the community or involvement in church. Uh, whatever might distract from earning money, his mind is always on business, how to make more money. He runs after it. He runs after it as if he had no heavenly father who has promised to care for him. He lives or she lives as an orphan. Well, the one who trusts in money, or the one who hoards money, or the one who worries about money, or the one who uses money to seek to make themselves attractive, or the one who is always running after it, may be a professed Christian, but such a one lives as if they had no heavenly father. They think they have to take care of yourself. You need to ask yourself, am I one who trusts in money? Is that what makes me feel secure? Am I hoarding it? Am I worrying about it all the time? Am I trying to use it to impress people? These are the questions you need to ask. Well, if you should discover that indeed you are not as strong in faith, hope, and love as you want to be, there is a cure for money sickness. 
The first is to recognize the foolishness of greed and running after it. We've already considered some of the foolishness of trusting in money, how uh, easily it is uh, it can evaporate or disappear, and how uh, indeed you will lose it all when, uh, when you die. Uh, it is uh, foolish because uh, life uh, is so short in comparison with the eternity uh, that we have coming uh, ahead of us. Uh, how much wiser is it to lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and thieves don't break in and steal, uh, to be rich toward God in the words of our text and to uh, seek first his kingdom. Such is uh, the wisdom of the word of God in urging you not to give in to greed and avarice. It is foolishness and so much wiser to be rich toward God. But knowing that, knowing that it is foolish and much wiser to be generous, much more in your own self-interest to be generous, knowing that will not give you the will to do it. This is one of the sad truths of our fallen nature, that we can know what's right and still not have the strength and the will to do it. What will make a difference? Where can we find the strength, the will, to do what we know is right? Well, only by recognizing the grace of God in our lives. Verse 32 says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He has given. He has given you the kingdom. It began on Christmas when he gave you his Son. It, it was fulfilled at, at Calvary where he offered his Son as a sacrifice to pay for your sins. It continues at Pentecost when he gives you the spirit of the down, as a down payment of the greater salvation which is to come. He has given you all these things. These are all parts of the, the kingdom that comes to us, the kingdom that is now within us, the kingdom that will one day fill the earth. That is yours. And why is it yours? Because you deserve it? No. Because you've earned it? No. He has given you the gift of his Son. He has given you the Spirit. He has given you the kingdom because he loves you for no other reason than that he is a loving God. Consider the grace of God. In view of the mercies of God, Offer your lives now to him. Only when we are overwhelmed by the undeserved kindness and mercy of God are we transformed by the power of his love to become the kind of people that we ought to be so that our hope is not to get rich. Our hope is to know Jesus. The Apostle Paul wrote at the end of his life. Indeed, he says, Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He's talking about his heritage as a Pharisee of Pharisees, as uh, circumcised on the eighth day, his uh, uh, Roman citizenship, his uh, worldly possessions, whatever he has. He says, I count everything a loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings and become like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. What he wants is not the things of this world. 
He wants Christ. He wants the power of the resurrection to be at work in his life now, in this life. And he wants to participate in the resurrection of the dead at the last day. That's what he wants. Like the psalmist who said, One thing I have desired, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. Or in Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my heart pants for you, O God. Faith. Is your faith in God? Are you trusting Him to take care of you, to provide food and clothing and shelter, to provide everything that you need? Hope. Have you set your hope fully on the grace that will be revealed in the day of Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Peter admonishes us, set your faith, hope, set your hope fully on the grace that will be revealed in the day of Jesus Christ. And love, do you love God? And is it seen in your eagerness to support the work of missions and benevolence? May 2024 be a year in which we grow in faith, hope, and love and show it by our attitudes toward money. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for this warning for, from Jesus that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. Help us, O oh Father, to place our heart in your hands to love you with heart and soul and mind and strength, to grow in faith and hope and love, in gratitude that you have already given us the kingdom. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us respond to God's word by singing number 467, Cast Down, O God, the Idol. Stand if you're able and sing all three stanzas of 467. We worship God now with our gifts and tithes and offering. Our offering is for Grace Reformed Church, the ministry 
led by Reverend Sam Perez. Our doxology is number 46A, stanzas 1, 3, and 5.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.